Amen. Thank you, Terry and Choir. It's now time for our children, ages 4 through 8, to be dismissed to Children's Church. Separate activities for your age group, children ages 4 through 8. This is your time. If y'all gather down here in the corner, your workers will be with you momentarily. Uh, some of them are in the choir today, so they'll be with you in just a second. While they're preparing for Children's Church, I would ask you to prepare for the, the message this morning. If you would, open your Bibles to Ephesians chapter 5. Ephesians chapter 5, as we continue this series uh, studying the book of Ephesians that we began some time back. Again, I want to remind you that we're in the application portion of this book. There's many life lessons for us. We spent several weeks or months even looking at the first three chapters of the book of Ephesians, which is Paul kind of rehearsing again, reminding the church at Ephesus of all that he had taught them by way of the gospel. And he was reminding them of that truth, that eternal truth. Amen? That eternal truth of the gospel. Once we got into chapter 4, which began a couple of weeks back, we got into now, he's saying that you've been reminded of all that I have taught you. Here is how you can apply it to your life. Here is how you can live it out. That's why we referred to this sermon series as Ephesians, Foundations for Salvation and Christian Living. So if indeed you are a follower of Christ, if indeed you have accepted Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, if indeed you go by the descriptive title of Christian, then these are words for us. Now, there, if there's others in this room who have not yet accepted Jesus as Lord and Savior, we are not leaving you out. Paul is, is wants you to be aware of what the, the significance is of following Christ. And in today's message, I believe you will hear such a, an emphasis. We're going to be looking at uh, chapter 5, verses 1 through 14. Today is our background passage. We're going to focus on one verse. That verse is verse number 8. But to give you the context... I want you to be exposed to the entirety of this passage. If you're willing and able, rise with me as we honor God's Word today. I trust you found your way to the book of Ephesians. I would encourage you to keep your Bible open throughout the duration of the message this morning. If you don't have a copy of God's Word, there is a copy in the pew pockets in front of you. Your neighbor will share with you, and I encourage you next week to bring your Bible with you. If you don't have a copy of the Bible... Let me know. This church will give you a copy of the Bible. Amen? That, that's why we hold this thing so dear. This is the eternal, inerrant, inspired, infallible Word of God. And, and we are people of the Word. Amen? Christ was a man who fulfilled the Word. He's the very Son of God who this Word is about. That's how much we treasure this Word. And today we read a portion of that. Ephesians chapter 5, beginning in verse 1. Paul says... Therefore, be imitators of God as beloved children, and walk in love just as Christ also loved you and gave Himself up for us, an offering and a sacrifice to God as a fragrant aroma. But immorality or any impurity or greed must not even be named among you as is proper among saints. And there must be no filthiness and silly talk or coarse jesting, which are not fitting, but rather giving of thanks. For this you know with certainty, that no immoral or impure person or covetous man who is an idolater has an inheritance in the kingdom of Christ and God. Let no one deceive you with empty words. For because of these things, the wrath of God comes upon the sons of disobedience. Therefore, do not be partakers with them, for you were formerly darkness, but now you are light in the world, in the Lord. Walk as children of light, for the fruit of the light consists in all goodness and righteousness and truth, trying to learn what is pleasing to the Lord. Do not participate in the unfruitful deeds of darkness, but instead even expose them, for it is disgraceful even to speak of the things which are done by them in secret. But all things become visible when they are exposed by the light. For everything that becomes visible is light. For this reason it says, Awake, sleeper, and arise from the dead, and Christ will shine on you. May God add His blessing to the reading and hearing of His Word. You may be seated. As I mentioned a moment ago, this passage 
We're going to focus on one verse. And the reason is because as I was studying this passage, as I was preparing this message, as I was looking over how God was speaking to me through this passage so that I could convey that message to us as a body of believers, verse number 8 kept standing out to me. It kept standing out to me. Verse number 8 says, For you were formerly darkness, but now you are light in the Lord. Walk as children of of light. Walk as children of light. That's why this morning I've given the title of this sermon, Children of Light. Because this is the admonition we need to follow this morning. We're going to talk about this verse in more detail. In more detail. I I, I trust you to find your way to the bulletin. Inside the bulletin is the outline. There's really just two points today. Focusing on this particular verse, verse number 8. Let's dive into it. Point number one is this, or at least the first part of point number one. Paul says to the believers at Ephesus, by extension, Paul is saying to you and I. By further extension, he's saying to all people who have ever decided and made a heart change and decided to follow Jesus Christ, their Lord and Savior. Anybody who is truly a Christian, Paul is saying at one time, you were darkness. He didn't say you lived in darkness. He didn't say you knew what darkness was. He didn't say you lived in a dark world. Paul said what? You were darkness itself. Darkness itself. Well, what does he mean by that? What is darkness? Of course, Paul's using this as a metaphor. We're not literally darkness in the sense that one understands darkness in a physical sense. But Paul uses it as a metaphor to describe how former believers, including you and I, how we once lived. Am I right? It describes our former, li- our former lives. Am I right about that? Anybody got a confession to that? Anybody? We all lived in darkness. We all were darkness. But Thank you. I got an amen in the house finally today. You know, but dark- what is darkness? If if you're to think in a physical sense, of course, the darkness is simply the absence of light. We just talked about this in a Bible study on Sunday evening here in recent weeks. And I shared with them an illustration I've shared with y'all before, but I still think it is so appropriate to share it again today. If you get tired of hearing my same old stories, uh, I apologize, but sometimes these stories have, have truth and application. Back several years back, we were, I was in the latter, time, latter years of my naval service. We were stationed in Kings Bay, Georgia, just north of Jacksonville, Florida, the submarine base down there. I was employed in doing uh, repairs to the nuclear submarines. I was uh, writing um, repair procedures and stuff like that. That's what I was doing. But at any rate, I was also teaching a Sunday school class. It was a co-ed class. Men and women, sometimes, uh, most of the people were married, some of those were divorcees, single, it didn't matter, they were all welcome into the class, but pr- primarily as a co-ed class of uh, people in their 30s or something like that. At any rate, I, I had a lesson on darkness. I wanted to illustrate what darkness was. And to illustrate what darkness was, I took a big old mason jar, about a gallon size, it might not have been mason, but some type of a big old clear jar. I wrapped that thing completely from, from top to bottom with duct tape. I wanted to make sure that light could not get in or out of that jar. And I, say, and I said, and I took that jar, and one night, it was a Saturday night before the lesson on Sunday morning, Kings Bay, Georgia, or Kingsland, Georgia, is a small town, but it still has lights like Kershaw does. I wanted to get out where it's completely dark. So I drove down this road up a little bit north, and and towards the west of Kingston, I went out probably, I don't know, 10 or 15 miles to get as far away as I could from any source of light. I found a place that was completely devoid of any civilization out there. I I didn't even see any cows out there, Brother Arnold. There was no life that I could see out there. So I I took my my vehicle, by the way, and my Ford F-150. I apologize, that's before I bought the F-150. Some other run-down vehicle that I had, but I, I drove that vehicle out there, and I, and I got out there several miles outside the town. I, I found this spot. I pulled off the road. I, I had a flashlight with me, but I, I took, cut my engine off, cut my headlights off, took my flashlight, walked my way through, through the, the, the woods out there, found a spot that I was pretty sure was completely dark. 
I cut off my flashlight, and sure enough, I couldn't see anything. I couldn't see anything. Clouds were in the sky, so even the moonlight wasn't showing. So I took that mason jar I had, that jar that I taped up so light couldn't penetrate, and I used that thing and I scooped up some darkness, scooped up some of that darkness, put the lid on real tight so it couldn't seep out. I was satisfied with myself. I took my flashlight and I made my way back to my vehicle. I made my way to Sunday school class the next morning. We were talking about darkness. I said, I want to show you what darkness is. And I took that jar, I opened the lid, and I showed it and said, Here, here's darkness. What happened? Somebody said they laughed at me. That is true. They, they laughed at me like some of y'all are chuckling right now. Was there any darkness in that jar? There was no jar. Why was there no darkness in the jar? Did I let it out? Did it, did it seep out? I'm telling you, I taped that thing up tight and could put the lid on there. What happened? What happened to my darkness? Yeah, I didn't lose my darkness. The, the darkness didn't run out of the jar. It didn't seep out. or decip- it was, The light in the classroom got into the jar. Did it not? And what happened? The light overtook the darkness. The light overtook the darkness. And it always does. Amen? And that was the point of the lesson that morning. But darkness, we think of it like it's, it's simply the, the absence of light. Now, Scripture speaks a lot to darkness, including physical darkness. Turn back with me to the very beginning of the Bible. Genesis chapter 1. Genesis chapter 1. Verses 1 and 2. Scripture tells us, In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. The earth was formless and void, and what? Darkness was over the surface of the deep. Darkness was over the surface of the deep. When Scripture's talking about darkness there, I believe God, through the Spirit, communicating to Moses, who authored this book, was talking more than just the physical darkness. Was it physically dark at that point? Yeah, because it wasn't until later we see that God created the the stars and the the sun and the light and dark, and He separated light from darkness. So yeah, there was darkness, there was no, no sense of light, no form of physical light at that point. But I believe darkness at that point, God is conveying a message that that, that says that darkness was kind of symbolic of all the chaos that was going on in the world at that point. Genesis 1.1 says, God created the heavens and the earth. The earth was what? Formless and void. It was just a chaotic world at that point before He completed His creation. Darkness is symbolic of of all the chaos in the world. Darkness is where evil hides, am I right? That is where evil resides. Darkness, is, according to the Scriptures, often thought of as a curse. It's thought of as a curse. In the Old Testament, death is often portrayed or communicated as a, being a land of darkness. A land of darkness. That's what death is described as being. In the New Testament, death or darkness is a a place of punishment. Is a place of punishment. So darkness, darkness is pretty significant when you're referred to as being in darkness of or of darkness or being dark. It's pretty significant in Scripture. In fact, darkness is hostile to God. Turn toward the end of the Bible. 1 John chapter 1 verse 5. 1 John 1, verse 5, John writes, This is the message we've heard from Him and announce to you that God is, what? Light. And in Him there is no darkness at all. God is light and in Him there is no darkness at all. God, or darkness is hostile to light. Darkness is, or excuse me, darkness is hostile to God. Darkness is hostile to God. 
And if we're to be sons of God, darkness is hostile to us. Turn back to Ephesians chapter 5 again. I apologize for making you do these Bible drills this morning, but it's good for all of us. Ephesians chapter 5, our focal verse, you were formerly darkness, but now you are light in the Lord. Walk as children of light. That first phrase, you were formerly darkness, or you were once darkness. Your translation may say something very similar to that, or very different, but the word and the idea about being darkness itself, that appeared in every translation I looked up. Every translation I got in my, in my study over there, which is most of the more common translations, I didn't look up every translation, they're so numerous, but most of the common translations, or all of them said, you were formerly darkness, or a phrase similar to that, but the darkness was used in them all. None of the translations, by the way, not a single one of those translations said, you once lived in darkness, None of those translations said you were once surrounded by darkness. None of those translations said you lived in accordance with the ways of darkness. Every translation, every translation of the Bible, every one we have tells us we were once darkness. And that's a hard pill to swallow, is it not? That's a hard pill to swallow. We were once darkness. That is, until the light penetrated our hearts like the light penetrated that jar. Amen? When light penetrates us into our lives, that darkness is gone. Amen? Darkness is gone. Now here's a word of caution for you. A word of caution. Goodness is not the same as being the opposite of darkness. Don't get those two mixed up. Goodness is not, necess- it's not equated with being opposite of darkness. Here's the reason why. Everybody needs to hear this. And all of us know somebody, I'm sure. There are a lot of good people in hell today because they never allow the light to penetrate their lives. They may have been good, kind people. They may have been good, compassionate people. They may have been good, Loving people, they may have been good serving people, giving people, etc. You know, they, they were very generous people, whatever, but they never allow the light to penetrate their heart. They were darkness, they're still darkness, they're living in hell, which is a land of darkness. Amen. Goodness does not mean you are outside the realm of darkness. Paul says we were once darkness. All of us who now have faith in Jesus Christ, we could say we were once darkness. But it goes on. Paul says, you were formerly darkness, but now you are light in the Lord. Now you are light in the Lord. That's part 2A. We're going to kind of jumble around these points today. Point 1A was we were once darkness. Point 2A, if you want to call it that, is we are now light. We are now light. I want you to think of this. If this statement is true, if darkness equals the absence of light, do we we agree with that? Darkness equals the absence of light. If that is true, and if now we are now light, do we believe that to be true? Paul says we are now light. So if darkness is the absence of light, and if we are, and since we are now light, therefore you and I can dispel the darkness of this world. Amen? If darkness is the absence of light, and if you and I are light, when we go into a dark world, what should happen to that world? The darkness should disappear. Am I right? Am I right? You know, uh, if, if Christ is light, as Scripture tells us He is, if Christ is light and if Christ is in us, that means His light is in us, we can't help but to impact those around us, can we? That's what light does. That's what light does. 
How many of y'all have ever been into a dark cavern? We went down into the Grand Canyon caverns, I think they were called, a few years back. And you get down underneath the earth, and you get in a cavern, and they've got some kind of lights on for safety purposes. Have you ever been in a canyon or a cavern like that, and somebody cuts off the lights? What can you see? Absolutely nothing. I'm not talking about you just can't tell what something is. You can't see it at all. You can wave your hand in front of your face, and if there's no light, you can't see it at all. How effective is light? If one person in that deep, dark cavern was to light a little teeny, tiny candle, what happens? It's amazing. It lights up that cavern. And no, it's not as bright as the lights are in here today. No, it's not like the, the, the electric lights that have strung in there for safety purposes. But one little teeny tiny candle can dispel the darkness in that vast cavern. Are you getting the picture? Are you getting the picture? John verse 8, John chapter 8, verse 12, I should say. It's another passage that amplifies the truth we're exploring today. The words of Christ I am the light of the world. He who follows me will not walk in the darkness, but will have the light or the light of life. What's that tell us about Jesus? Jesus is the light of the world. Jesus is the light of the world. But back in our focal passage in Ephesians chapter 5, <coughs> pardon me, Paul says. We are now light. We are now light. Is that a contradiction? I don't think so. More Bible drill. Turn back to Matthew chapter 5. Matthew chapter 5, verses 14 through 16. It's part of the Sermon on the Mount. The words of Christ again. He says, you are the light of the world. Let me say that again. You are the light of the world. He's talking to believers. You are the light of the world. A city set on a hill cannot be hidden, nor does anyone light a lamp and put it under a basket, but on the lampstand, and it gives light to all who are in the house. Let your light shine before men in such a way that they may see your good works and glorify your Father who is in heaven. John chapter 8, verse 12, Jesus said that He, He says, I am the light of the world, speaking of Himself. Here in Matthew chapter 5, who is, who's the light of the world? We are. We're the light of the world. Which means we are now like Jesus. No, we're not perfect. Amen? Amen? Y'all know I'm not perfect. And I know y'all ain't perfect. None of us are perfect. Jesus is perfection. We're not there yet. But Jesus is equating us with Himself. Paul says we're the light of the world. We are light in the Lord. Jesus said He is the light of the world, but He also says we are the light of the world. So our task then is to glorify God by letting our light shine in such a way that the world is drawn to Him. Amen? That's the gist of what he's saying in Matthew chapter 5. Our light should shine in such a way that the world could be drawn to Him. Okay, let's wrap this thing up. Application. Remember, the first three chapters of Ephesians talked about doctrine, theology, 
Paul summarizing the gospel as he taught it to the church at Ephesus. Chapters 4 through 6 is talking about application. So let's apply this idea about we were once darkness, we are now light. What's the application part? If it, it, let's start with the first, the darkness. If we were once darkness, if we were once darkness, considering everything we learned about darkness a while ago, if that once was who we are, what's that say about us? Well, we were once darkness. Now, we, or back then, we were a part of the problem. Amen? We were a part of the problem. And this part of the sermon convicted me terribly when I was preparing it. Because I was thinking back to my days when I did not follow Christ, even though I claimed to be a Christian. You know, there are people in my life that I have personally led astray. I'm not proud of that. I was darkness. And I helped them to live as darkness themselves. See, they followed my lead. They followed my lead so that they too walked in darkness. They followed my example. And they traveled down a road of despair. They looked to me. And they followed me down a path of destruction. They took my lead. They scurried down a walkway of doom and gloom. I did them wrong. I was darkness. They too were darkness. Why did they do this? Why they follow my lead? Because I was darkness itself. And I was a part of the problem. How about you? Believe it or not, you were too. Amen? Amen. But, Paul also says we're light. He says, but now you are light in the Lord. Since we are now light, we are now a part of the solution. Amen? We're now a part of the solution. Since I am now light... I am part of the solution. Since you are now light, you are a part of the solution. Amen? We're a part of the solution. The light that we have within us can penetrate the darkness of this dead and dying world. Amen? If I do not... Let this light shine. If I am now light and I don't let Christ's light shine in me, it's as if I've placed my light under a basket, like he said back in Matthew. If you don't let your light shine, it's like you put your light in a basket where nobody can see it. Where nobody can see it. Remember that little light in the cavern? One little light, one little candle can light up a cavern so that others can see. Amen? I don't know about y'all, but I'm going to let my light shine. Amen? Amen? How many of y'all remember this song? This little light of mine, I'm going to let it shine. This little light of mine, I'm going to let it shine. Let it shine, let it shine, let it shine. If Christians would really let our light shine, can you imagine the difference in our world? Amen? 
if we allowed our light to shine, darkness would be dispelled all around us. But too often, too often, we decide we're going to let somebody else shine their light. We'll let somebody else make a difference in the world. That's not the attitude of a Christ follower. We need to have the attitude and the mind of Christ. I want my light to shine brighter and brighter and brighter and brighter. Amen? Finally, something else to ponder. With that idea about letting our light shine, I want you to think about the past week. The past seven days. Start, say, at 11 o'clock or 11.30 when we dismissed last Sunday to now. Seven day period of time. What did you do this past seven days? To let your light shine. What did you do this past seven days to make a difference in the world? What did you do this past seven days to tell somebody about Jesus? And if you're having a hard time coming up with the answer to those three questions, maybe you're not letting your light shine. So let's think about the next seven days. From this point to next Sunday, what will you do the next seven days to let your light shine? What will you do the next seven days to make a difference in this world? What will you do the next seven days to tell somebody about Jesus? Amen? We need to let our light shine. Father God, help us to make our light burn brighter and brighter and brighter and brighter so the world will know that Christ is in us. And our light will dispel the dark there in. We praise things in Jesus' name. Amen. Let's stand.